And I would like to thank Troy for his leadership in the song service and the, just how the Lord directs him to these awesome songs that we are able to sing. And he was right about Brandy and Chazelle. Thank them when you see them. <clears throat> Yesterday, the kids were outside, Macy and Ethan, our, our two kids, and um, they were playing, and I was taking care of some stuff in the house. And they came running in, and they told me, Pastor Chazelle was here. And I thought, what? I didn't hear anybody drive up. I didn't, I didn't hear anything. And she left bags for them for Easter. And it meant a lot. And it was awesome. So remember to thank Brandy and Chazelle. Maybe, not a, maybe if you don't stop by here, thank them in some way. With this being Easter Sunday, uh, Reverend Bond, our district superintendent, and Roger Unruh, our church board secretary, um, were deciding about who was going to speak. And, and they said, you know, we, we really want to get a special speaker for, for Easter Sunday. Why don't we have the best preacher in the world come and speak to us? And so they called the best preacher in the world, and, and, and that person said no. And so then they decided, well, if we can't have the best speaker, at least we can have the smartest one. And so they called that person, and that person also said no. So they were trying to figure out what to do and, and um, brainstorming together about what they could do. And, and they said, well, if we can't get the best preacher and if we can't get the smartest preacher, at least we can get the best looking preacher. And so they called that person up and that person also said no. And finally they said, well, you know, we could, we could call John. You know, he, he fills in when, whenever he can and, and we, could, we could have him be our preacher. And so they called me and and I thought, what could I say? I'd already told them no three times. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's great to be with you this morning. And we have the best topic in the world to, to speak on. We always have the best topic every Sunday. But uh, there is added focus today. A great passage of Scripture great hope in our resurrected Lord. John chapter 20, verses 10 through 18. John chapter 20, verses 10 through 18, and I'll also make reference to another verse a little later. John 20, verses 10 through 18. Hear the word of the Lord. Then the disciples returned to their homes. That is after they had seen the empty tomb. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, 
to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And one of the great things about Mary Magdalene, John speaks only of her, but Mary Magdalene and the other ladies who went to the tomb, chapter 20 verse 1 says that she came to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the tomb. We have the account that I read of where Jesus came to her and spoke to her and talked to her. But we also understand that the stone had been rolled away. There is a poem that reads, Come, see the hillside in the dawn, the cross bereft of Him who died. See the open cleft that greets the day, the empty tomb wherein He lay. Go quickly, leave the place of death, and swiftly run to those who have not heard the victories won, who watch and wait, make haste to teeming throngs who need to know for whom the news, unless you quickly go, will come too late. And tell, O oh, spread the news as long as you have breath, that Jesus holds the keys to hell and death. His name be praised. For He is risen as He said, and in that glorious rising from the dead, we too are raised. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ today, and like I said in my prayer, we actually celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ every Sunday. And yes, this Easter, this year, it's a little different than others. I so wish we could all be together here. But we're doing what we have to for the safety of each other. And we still celebrate. We give praise to God who moved that stone and the God who still moves stones in our day. Be it the coronavirus, be it whatever issues are in our lives right now beside the coronavirus, any problem that may present itself to us, God still move stones for us. What does Easter stand for? There are many answers to that question. But here are some ideas for you this Resurrection Sunday. And if, if you wanted to go grab a, a pen and a piece of paper, I'll wait for you. At least for a little while. Go ahead. Go get some paper. Go get a pen or a pencil. All right, you have them? Let's go. Easter. First letter E. E stands for an empty tomb that provides hope in a hopeless world. A father and his teenage son were living in Mexico City. They had an argument, and the son, Paco, shouted curses at his father and then stormed out of the house and didn't return. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months. The father searched the city over and over, and finally, in desperation, he went down to the newspaper. So you know this happened a while ago if he went down to the newspaper and took out an ad. The ad read, Paco, if you read this, I want you to know all is forgiven. I love you and I will be waiting for you this Sunday at the entrance to the city park. I hope you show up. Love, Dad. 
that Sunday morning, the Sunday morning when, when this father was supposed to meet his son, 200 men named Paco showed up at the park, all looking for forgiveness. So many people in our world today are searching, searching for hope, searching for meaning, yes, searching for forgiveness. And the good news of Easter is that the empty tomb provides hope in a world that is sorely lacking hope. Matthew 12, verses 20 and 21 say, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In his name the nations will put their hope. That describes many people today. Bruised reeds, smoldering wicks. Perhaps we have been bruised by the trials of life. Perhaps we were bruised by harsh words from somebody, or a friend's anger, or a spouse's betrayal, or by our own failure or the failure of those around us. Perhaps we feel like smoldering wicks. Perhaps at one time our passion for God, our passion for the ministries of the church, our passion for life, perhaps at one time they were burning brightly. But the winds of life and the harshness of life have blown and now maybe we feel like there's one stiff breeze like the breeze we have today. One stiff breeze away from the flame going out altogether. There are many bruised reeds and smoldering wicks that we find in the Word of God. A woman standing before an angry crowd wanting to punish her for her sins. A leper, an outcast, shunned from society. A blind man on the side of the road. A paralytic lying on a stretcher. A woman with a long-term illness. A crippled man, crippled from birth, waiting by the beautiful gate, hoping somebody will give him coins so that he can exist not live but exist another day bruised reeds smoldering wicks the world is good about breaking those reeds in two and snuffing out those smoldering wicks but what did Jesus say What did Matthew tell us? Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In his name the nations will put their hope. The great message of Easter is that if God was powerful enough to move the stone and raise His only begotten Son, then He is powerful enough to move the stones that are blocking the way in our lives. The resurrection gives us hope in the face of the unfairness of the world. Some people think the pandemic we are going through right now is unfair. And it is. We're cut off from family. We're cut off from friends. We're cut off from joining together as a church in one place. But you know what? It doesn't stop God. He's still working. He's still doing a great work for us. And as I said, the resurrection gives us hope in the face of the unfairness of the world. It gives us strength. It gives us courage. 
in every situation that we face. God offered it to us, and He still does. You need it. I need it. We all need it. And the strength that God had moving that stone away from the tomb is the strength that He provides us today. So E is the empty tomb. A is for the angel who invited them to look into the tomb. Not only Mary Magdalene and the other ladies that were there, but also two of the disciples, Peter and John, looked as well. Matthew actually records that when the women came to the tomb, more than just Mary Magdalene, there were, there were other women that came too. The first thing that the angel did was to invite them inside. The angel said to them, Come and see the place where he lay, for he was no longer there. Look at the evidence. God still invites us to look at the evidence. It's there if we want to investigate. An empty tomb, undisturbed grave cloths, 2,000 pound stone or however heavy it was that has been rolled away. Over 515 eyewitnesses. Think about that for a minute. If, if each person that had witnessed the resurrected Lord if they came and talked for 15 minutes apiece, and of course we can't do that now because of social distancing and stay-at-home orders, but, but if they would all come and give testimony to what they saw, just 15 minutes for each one, and then on to the next eyewitness for another 15 minutes, we would be here all day today and all night. And Monday, and Monday night, and Tuesday, and Tuesday night, and Wednesday, and Wednesday night, and Thursday, and Thursday night, until sometime Friday morning. That's over 128 straight hours, ladies and gentlemen. The evidence shows us that Jesus was raised. The tomb was empty. And millions throughout the years will attest to this reality. And those of us who have Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, we can attest to that reality. That Jesus is no longer here, but He is risen just as He has said. 2 Timothy 1.12 tells us, this is the Apostle Paul writing, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him until that day. Note that Paul did not say, I know what I have believed. Paul said, I know whom I have believed. And this morning you can do the same. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that He is risen from the dead. He is alive and at work in the world, and He is making a difference in my life and in the life of so many others. People throughout the centuries have, have met Jesus firsthand and followed Him and let Him transform their lives. How? Because they have stopped running from God. They have allowed God not only to pursue them, but to capture their hearts. Even those who consider themselves atheists, who set about to prove that Jesus' resurrection did not happen, they ended up being overwhelmed by the evidence and person of Jesus Christ. Those like Lou Wallace, who wrote the book Ben-Hur, which the movie was based off of. And journalists like Lee Strobel, for example. You may not know Lee Strobel, but you may know a book that he wrote, the first one he, book, he wrote, called The Case for Christ. 
He was a journalist, or still is a journalist, actually, but he was an atheist. And he went about trying to investigate the claims of Christ the way that a reporter would. Probably to, to make it seem like, well, yeah, I knew it all along that, that this is wrong. Jesus isn't who he says he is. But he came to know Jesus through his searching, through his investigation. Those who at first discounted the resurrection ended up meeting Jesus Christ himself. And they decided to follow him as Savior and Lord. Come and see. The angel said, investigate and you will believe. So the angel invites us still to come and look and investigate. And then there is S in Easter. Surprise at an empty grave. A four-year-old boy was given offering money by his father so that he could place it in the offering envelope of his Sunday school class. And the father was surprised that after the Sunday school hour had ended, the boy returned to him with the offering money still in his hand. And the father asked his son, well, why do you still have the money? And in all seriousness, the boy said, as serious as a four-year-old can get, he said, Dad, Jesus hardly ever shows up down there in his Sunday school class. Not many people expected Jesus to show up that Sunday morning either. <laughs> but what a surprise. Good Friday, after Jesus had given up His Spirit and died, the disciples were downcast, downtrodden. Holy Saturday, we don't know what happened that day. But people were probably still in mourning over the death of Jesus. But Sunday came. Sunday came. And Jesus showed up. Everyone involved was surprised at how it turned out. The soldiers who guarded the tomb didn't have an answer. The Pharisees were caught trying to come up with a backup plan. Although none of their plans had worked up to that point and none of their plans would work from that point on. The religious leaders who thought that they buried the one who challenged their way of life were shocked when Sunday morning came and the stone was rolled away. Jesus was victorious over sin and death and the grave and the enemy of our souls. That's the best surprise ever. The greatest surprise ever. So there was the empty tomb. There was the angel who invited people to come and look and still invites people to come and look. And there was surprise at an empty grave. Now we get to tea. And we tell, that is the command that the women and the disciples were given, and that is the command that we are given today. As I said, the women were told to go and tell this good news to others. The disciples were told to go and tell. Though this command was given, it is the one that so many have chosen to ignore. Those of, us, those of us who have searched and investigated and satisfied it in our own hearts and lives that we have received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we are also commanded to go and tell others. Yet, many times we, we just sit quietly as opportunity after opportunity passes us by.
Some people have said the most effective mode of evangelism is one person inviting another person to come to church with them. And yes, I know now we're hindered from doing that. We can't really invite people to come to church when we ourselves can't go to church. But perhaps you believed I was going to say the most effective mode of evangelism is one person telling another person about Jesus Christ. And that is, that is the best way, and that is probably the ideal way. But the reality is that 90 to 95 percent of all commitments to Christ come after a person has accepted an invitation to attend church. A person invites another person to come to church where they will hear the gospel. And then in time, if they continue attending, they will invite Jesus into their heart. Remember the Samaritan woman from John chapter 4? Come and see a man who knows all that I have done and yet still loves me. She invited people to come. Not to church, but to see Jesus. And that's why we invite people to church. Or that's why we will invite people to church after this pandemic crisis is over. Because we want people to come and see this Jesus who has changed our lives. And yes, the ideal way would be to tell them about Jesus Christ even before they enter the doors of a church building, this building or any other church building. But remember, after this is all over, invite people to come. Go and tell. The responsibility for sharing Christ still falls on each of us. But more people are open to receive it when they have come to church and they have opened up their lives to the influence of godly persons. The heart is prepared and then someone shares the gospel with them and they come to know the Lord. Paul planted. Apollos watered. Remember that? It takes all of us together to help someone come to know the Lord. Many times, though, it starts with someone inviting a friend to church. And again, when all of this passes, and it will pass, it will be here for a season. We do not know how long. But when this passes, invite someone to church. Invite a friend. Invite a neighbor. And let them see what God is doing. Not only what God is doing in your life, but what God is doing in the lives of others. God is still working in the midst of all of this. The Holy Spirit is still convicting people. Circumstances that people find themselves in are softening their hearts. In time they respond and receive salvation. If they do not turn further away. We need to make sure that people have an opportunity to respond and to receive salvation. And then when the opportunity comes, that they can also be entirely sanctified. But that's another sermon for another day. Go and tell. Go and tell. Even in today's world, with a pandemic that seems to be shutting us off from others, go and tell in the ways you can. Go and tell. And then another E. Excitement that the women felt that morning. And excitement that we feel when we read these passages. I know that we've read them probably hundreds of thousands of times. But just like with other portions of the Bible, it is always new. Excitement about that day. Many of you may remember the family circus cartoon that ran in many newspapers. There was one that ran on a Good Friday where little Billy, one of the boys, and his brother are walking along through a store looking at all of the Easter eggs and candy on the shelves. 
And Billy turns to his little brother and he says, this may be Good Friday, but Sunday is going to be even gooder. And that may not be correct English, but it is profound. Early that first Easter morning, the women and the disciples who were the first to find the tomb empty didn't realize just how much gooder Sunday was going to be. But it was. It was better. We don't always see right away how things are going to turn out. And that doesn't make us happy because, because we tend to be impatient people. We want to make sure that we know how things are going to turn out. And we've got to make sure that everything is done yesterday. When sometimes God calls us to wait. The disciples had to wait. There was Friday. There was Saturday. And then Sunday came. What a difference a day makes. Private First Class Jessica Lynch was part of a group of soldiers in the 507th Maintenance Company that was ambushed by Iraqi forces. And over a week later, she was still missing. And you can imagine during that time the anguish and the hurt and the confusion of her family, especially her parents, since she was missing and presumed dead. But also, during that week, it, it said over a week later she was still missing, but during that week in a daring rescue mission, Lynch was recovered and returned safely back home. And can you imagine the excitement of her family, especially her parents, now that Lynch was home? Can you imagine the difference of emotion from one day to another as, as, as people thought that she was dead, but yet she was found to be alive? What a difference a day makes. Many people live in day one or Good Friday, the day of the trial. They live where they're getting hit on all sides. Life is pouring in on them. If you are there in the midst of day one, maintain hope. Because what a difference a day makes. Other people may be living in day two, like the disciples on Saturday. The heat of the trial may be over, but now confusion and discouragement and frustration reign. Perhaps faith is weak. Remember Peter? The future seems cloudy and the outcome looks uncertain. But maintain faith. Because what a difference a day makes. All of us face day three. A day of victory. A day of good news. A day of renewed hope. If you are not there now, be assured that it is coming because Jesus has won the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world, as the hymn states. Day three means hope. It means a change of circumstances. And it means victory, either now or in heaven, or both. What a difference a day makes. Maintain your hope. Maintain your faith. Be encouraged and excited. The second E is for excitement. And lastly, R. For our resurrected Lord who is living today. Muhammad is still in the grave. Buddha is still in the grave. Confucius, Joseph Smith, Mary Baker Eddy, all are still in the grave. Our Jesus is not. What a truth! Faith in Christ works because only Jesus has been risen from the dead. No other religious leader defeated death. No 
other religious leader can make these claims. Jesus can. The resurrected Lord is the central event of our faith. The central purpose of our faith. It is the here it is moment of Christianity. Because of Easter, we know that God in Christ Jesus is more powerful than anything in life, even death. Because we know that Jesus Christ rules over death. The resurrection is not just another thing that we believe as Christians. The resurrection is the very center of our faith. Everything hinges on the resurrection. Is Jesus Christ alive today? Yes, He is. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. When life gets difficult, that is a great truth to hold on to. The Christian writer and lecturer K. Arthur wrote a devotional that that was called, Lord, I need grace to make it today. Perhaps you are feeling the same way. That you need grace, you need forgiveness, and you need hope. You will find all those in a resurrected Lord and Savior named Jesus Christ. You may need to make a decision today. A decision to have Jesus Christ as your Savior. A decision to grow closer to Jesus. A decision decision to answer a call to ministry on your life. Not necessarily to become a pastor or a missionary or Christian leader in that way. But an area of ministry that Jesus or God has been talking with you about. Perhaps it is a decision to be assured that when you die, after the resurrection of all of us, you will live with Jesus forever. The Bible tells us we all are sinners. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. It also says that we are in need of a Savior. But it goes on to state that if you repent of your sins... And if you give your life over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, you will be saved. The God who rolled the stone away from the entrance to the tomb where Jesus lay is the same God that can give us victory over sin, death, the grave, the enemy of our souls. He still rolls stones away. And will you allow Him to roll the stones of disappointment and discouragement and sadness and bitterness and anger from your life today? Remember Easter. Remember the empty tomb. Remember the angel. Remember the surprise of the empty tomb. The empty tomb where people weren't expecting it. Remember to go and tell others. Remember the excitement about the empty tomb that we can still have. And remember the resurrected Lord who loves us, who cares for us, who wants to still make a difference in our lives. Remember there is a God who still moves stones, who still rolls stones away. He wants to move whatever stone may be hindering your relationship with Jesus today. Will you allow Him to roll it away? 
Shall we pray together? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great day. We thank you for your word which speaks powerfully to us. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that you appeared to Mary Magdalene in the garden after your resurrection. We thank you that the stone was rolled away from the tomb. We thank you that God is still moving stones away for us. We thank you that no matter what happens in our lives, no matter what is happening in our lives, the coronavirus, the isolation, the stay-at-home orders, other things not even connected with the coronavirus that are happening in our lives. We thank you that none of them are bigger or greater than you are. When we focus on our problems, on our obstacles, on the issues that we have, they seem bigger than you, but they're not. May we rely on your strength, on your grace, on your mercy, on your power, on your love, today and every day. And may we take what Easter means and apply it in our lives, in our situation, today. If we are lonely, if we are bitter, if we are angry, if we are sad, may we give it over to you. If we are content, if we are satisfied, if we are happy, if we are joyful, may we also give that over to you as an offering of praise. And may we remember that you are still moving stones away. Stones that are too big, too, too monumental for us to move. You are still moving them. And give us grace and give us peace. As you continue to move stones away in our lives. Be with us, lead us, and guide us, and direct us. And Lord, we pray that you would be with this pandemic. And we pray that if it be your will, that soon it would just be eradicated from our world. And we could come back together and worship you in one place. We ask for your leadership and your guidance. We pray that you would be with the governments of our world. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that people would continue to turn to you. And Lord, there may be those turning for the first time to you through this awful disease. And we pray that you would be glorified and Lord, that people would see your hand at work even in the midst of everything else going on around us. Thank you for still moving stones, for rolling them away. May we be thankful and grateful to you for who you are and all that you have done for us and all you are continuing to do for us even during this season. And Lord, when this season passes, we pray that we would be able to look back and we would be able to say, look at what God did for us. Look at how great God is. Because you are. Give us all a great rest of this Lord's Day. Give us a great rest of this week. And may we completely trust in You. And may we lean on You more than we ever have in our lives. Give us peace. 
Give us mercy and give us grace. In the name of your holy and resurrected Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who we celebrate today, every Sunday, every day. Amen. Amen. And God bless you. Amazing grace.